So today we're going to talk um, about climate. Who knows the face of a gentleman on the right there? No more? No? Yes? 10, 15 people? Who knows what he was doing at the time? Yeah, yeah? So? Very good. And his name is? Laurent Fabius, exactly. Former Prime Minister of France. So Mr. Laurent Fabius, in December 2015, strikes like an auctioneer his hammer on the desk and declares accepted or approved the Paris Accords, which says that the countries of the planet will do their best to ensure that the temperature rise remains well below 2 degrees Celsius. So if this agreement was effectively, or rather, had an effective practical scope, I could replace this class with a big recess telling you that the problem is solved. And it wouldn't be worth bothering you to explain why, when what's up with this problem, it's fixed. So unfortunately, it will still take two and a half hours to explain to you that the problem is very, very far from being solved and that there's still a little bit of distance between the cup and the lips. Here you have a curve of the atmospheric CO2 concentration concentration expressed in millions, so we express the atmospheric concentration of CO2 in general, well, and I'm going to come back at length of what CO2 is and where it comes from, etc., but who is expressed in part per volume, that is, the mole fraction of the atmosphere expressed in volume, which is composed of CO2. These are millions, so what you have on this graph 300 ppm or 300 million, that's 0.03%, that's also a way that you can look at it. And instead of graduating according to years, for example, this year it corresponds to 1995 and this year corresponds to 2017, I graduated according to the number of the annual meeting of the Conference of the Parties of the Climate Convention. You know the Climate Convention, I'll come back to it during this course and the next one, it is the UN agreement that all the countries in the planet have signed and then ratified, which said that we were going to take care of you, that is to say the future generations, since it was signed in 1992, and I think that in 1992 there was not many people in this room who were already born. So the future generations are you, and in this paper we said we were going to take care of the future generations. And so that, it was signed in 1992 and then ratified in 1995. So in 1995, it was a, um, a great success since the climate convention, which says they were going to take care of you, comes into force. And there is the first annual meeting of the Conference of the Parties. So what we call the Conference of the Parties is not a bunch of butchers who come together and discuss which are the good cuts of the beef. No, the Conference of the Parties, it is the annual meeting of the parties to the convention because in the UN jargon, a country who signs or ratifies a convention is called a party, that's just how it is, and so the parties of the conventions are the countries, uh, or the entities, because the European Union has ratified, who have ratified the convention. So you're one of the life of this convention, which comes into force into 95, great success, obviously. 97 is the year of the Kyoto Protocol, which is, and I won't come back to it in detail, but which is an appendix of the climate convention in which we say, well, there are a number of countries in the world which are going to take quantitative reduction commitments, including France. So France said the emissions coming from my land will drop by 5% between such and such year. And a number of other countries have taken exactly the same type of commitments. So you see the effect it had on atmospheric concentration thereafter, yeah. arrives Copenhagen, described as a huge failure, oh well, arrives Paris, described as a huge success, we'll see. So this little introduction is there to show you that unfortunately, and we'll see it on an, a number of other curves that I'll show you later, up to now, the amount of noise made about climate change is a parameter which has no influence on what really happens. All right, so there are two decorrelated processes in the world, which are what really happens in terms of emissions and resulting climate processes, and the number of people who says that something should be done. All right, these are two processes which are, for the moment, totally distinct, unfortunately. We're going to talk about climate. And speaking of climate, I, I will insist, even for the good brains that you are, that we are going to talk about something that is inaccessible to your senses. All right, you may be very brilliant engineering students, 
elected to enter a very difficult to access school, you remain animals like me and therefore you trust your senses because the human species is a species that trusts its senses. So we date from a time where our senses told us that we had to escape the saber-toothed tiger who only thought of making a snack out of us. And so we are, we know the things that our senses give us in our immediate environment. Regarding climatic parameters, what our senses can indicate in our immediate environment is the immediate temperature where we are, possibly the precipitation immediately where we are, the luminosity immediately where we are, the nebulosity, that is to say the clouds, immediately where we are, the wind immediately where we are, etc. These parameters, appreciated locally and instantaneously in science, that leads to what is called the weather. So the weather is the instantaneous and local evolution, or in a very near future, of things that speak to our senses, that is the conditions that will be here. This morning, to know if I was going to put on a coat or not, I looked at the weather that it was going to be in Paris, and I don't care to a high degree of knowing what the weather is today in Buenos Aires, but my coat, that doesn't interest me. All that interests me is to put my coat on or not, is the weather that is going to be in Paris. So the climate, on the contrary, which we are going to talk about now, is something which is inaccessible to your senses, at least not in a direct way. It is in an indirect way, but it is inaccessible in a direct way because when we talk about climate, we talk about averages. And an average, you know it like me, is an intellectual construct, all right? It's a series or an integral, so it's something that you do not observe in nature. It is an intellectual construct, an average. Now, it is this intellectual construct that will make it possible to understand whether or not we are drifting out of the ordinary for something that is our usual environment. So, you still see indirect manifestations of climate in the world around us. For example, in the indirect manifestations, there is vegetation. Obviously, the vegetation that there is in Greenland, and there is much, the vegetation that there is in Africa, and the vegetation that there is in around the Mediterranean basin are not the same because the climate is not the same. So, indirect manifestations of climate, you see some, but direct manifestations, that is to say, approach and average with senses, you do not manage. So, there is a confusion, both in general. The confusion arises from the fact that in one case, like in the other, we handle the same criteria, that is to say that these are the same variables that we manipulate, but in one case we're going to look at the instantaneous and local values, and in the other we're going to look at the spatial averages, or temporal, or both and the regular variations of these averages. For example, the seasonal variation is part of the climate. You have seasonal variations which concern the temperatures, these are the middle latitudes, which are possibly concerned the fact that there is sun, these are the poles, or which concern the fact that there is a lot of rain or little rain, these are rather the equatorial regions. So you have seasonal variations which are not always the same depending on where you go. So I'm going to take another hit on my favorite enemies, namely journalists, I'll give you an example here of something that happened a few years ago. Of something that happened a few years ago, which I found interesting. There has been for a while an article in the newspaper, as there are from time to time with people who want to make themselves interesting by saying, look, there can be no global warming because of the planet right now, it doesn't heat up, it's cold. So it turns out that there was a day where, by chance, made it that there were negative anomalies, that is to say cooler temperatures than average, in a whole bunch of heavily populated places, you see a piece of Europe, a part of the United States, a part of Japan, etc. Now it turns out that where there are people, there are press agencies, and there are people to send out press releases. So there are lots of people who said, look, where I am here today, right now, it is cold. Except that at the same moment, neither the penguins, nor the dolphins in the middle of the Atlantic, nor all these people could say, ah, but you know, at our place, at the moment, it's much warmer than the average. So, in fact, if you really do the average with where it's colder and where it's warmer, there's no problem. The average of a whole planetary surface is well above its reference values. All right? And uh, this there, so it continues from time to time. It is um, rarer nowadays, but um, there are still some people who play these kinds of little games. It's pretty easy again by making confusion between an instantaneous value and an average. It only holds to that, and it's very easy again to abuse people who are unfamiliar with the subject because these are the same parameters and because our senses cannot tell us what an average is. There's another quirk which is quite classic, I have to change the year every year, but hey, it's the same principle. 
which is very classical when you are interested in this subject, which is to misinterpret its series. So there I could say that the effect of this process is the increase in temperatures. I could also say that it's the decrease of the number of pirate ships, because in fact the underwear have decreased at the same time as the number of pirate ships have declined. Anyways, it's very easy to misinterpret what is being observed until we understand the processes. So it's, uh, it's very easy to have a, a bad conclusion. The climate is therefore geographic, or rather, spatial and temporal averages, but in fact these averages are set to change. In fact, the Earth's climate since Earth's existence has never been stable over geological periods. So the geological period you don't really care about when you're a man or a woman because your life expectancy, if all goes well, is of the order of magnitude of a century. And even if everything goes bad, it's of the order of magnitude of a decade. Well, I don't, I don't wish it for you. Uh, so what happens over a million years? But Earth has gone through very, very contrasted times in terms of climate. For example, there was a time where there were no oxygen in the atmosphere, all right, where the terrestrial atmosphere was composed mainly of CO2, then methane and nitrogen. There has been times where the Earth was probably almost completely icy. The ice cap covered the almost entire Earth. There was a time when there was no continent. Anyways, Earth has gone through extremely varied uh, states. And if we look at the last few million years, that is to say the quaternary era, there was, even at that time, great climatic oscillations, which are the glaciation deglaciation, so the climate has not remained stable at all. And if we look at timescales, which are of a million years or less, we have a first forcing factor, which is called the astronomical forcing. So the astronomical forcing comes from the fact that the solar system is not a household of two, but a household of ten. So Earth is attracted by the big planets of the solar system. So we are not in a perfect ellipse, regular of a time, which is the one that you know how to calculate in a geometry or something, with just two bodies. We are in a system with ten bodies. So it doesn't work as well, or in any case, it is not regular. So there are variations of the orbit, and I'm coming to that right after, and it can distort the climate system on timescales of the order of 100,000 years. But continents are not always where they are. There's a drift, as you know, of continents, and depending on the location of where a continent is, well, the reflection of sunlight is more or less important. For example, when you have a continent approaching the poles, you may have a permanent ice caps that appear, typically Greenland. And at this point, you create very reflective surfaces, much more reflective in the ocean water that was there before. The installation of the Antarctic ice cap on the South Pole tens of millions of years ago, so I read 30 here, 15 there, but anyways, the order of magnitude is the same, well, has cooled the planetary climate of a few degrees. Because of the creation of this big mirror, which evacuates part of the solar radiation without it having the time to heat the floor. Afterwards, you have internal oscillations in the fluid compartment of uh, the atmosphere, notably processes that are related to large scale ocean circulation, which can change the climate over periods of time that range from the century to the millennium. And obviously, you have the internal dynamics of the atmosphere, but that changes the climate over periods that are very, very short. And then you have us, all the way down there, the anthropogenic cause. So be proud, we have become a climate agent, we have become an agent that forces the climate system. When you do the weather, I'll come back to it, the only compartment that reacts at the scale of the day is the atmosphere. So you make a good atmospheric model, you take your friends, well, not you because you don't know how to do it, but your friends at Super University, they know how to do it, and you send them to Météo France and you ask them to make a climate model and they will correctly forecast the weather, all right? On the other hand, if you want to see how the system evolves at the scale of the century, what we're going to talk about now, it's not enough to make a good atmospheric model. This is not enough. It is necessary to know how to model the evolution at these timescales of other compartments of a planet, and in particular of the ocean. In particular of the ocean. The ocean is the fluid compartment that drives the evolution of the climate on the century scale, much more than the atmosphere. So if you want to make a good weather model, you look up, and if you want to make a good climate model, on the contrary, you look down. At even longer time scales, as I said, it is the astronomical parameters that dominate. So these astronomical parameters, what are their variations? First of all, because of the attraction of large planets in the solar system, you have three parameters which will vary over time. 
The first is that, so the Earth does not make an exact ellipse since it deforms, but it's a quasi-ellipse whose eccentricity is more or less big, with a quasi-periodicity of 100,000 years. This is a first variation which is introduced by the attraction of the large planets. The second variation which is introduced by the large planets is that you have the axis of rotation of the Earth which is more or less inclined on the plane of the orbit. You understand that if the axis of rotation of the Earth was totally perpendicular to the plane of the orbit, well, would we have seasons? No, we wouldn't have any seasons, all right? Because the solar inclination would always be the same all year round, and therefore the amount of heat recovered at a given latitude would be the same all year round. And by the way, climate comes from the Greek word klima, K-L-I-M-A, which means inclination. On the other hand, when you have an extremely pronounced inclination, well, depending on the time of the year you are, you have a warm head or a cold buttocks or vice versa, and you have therefore a very big contrast between the seasons. All right? So the more inclined the axis gets to the plane of the orbit, actually, the closer it gets to the plane of the orbit, let's say, the more you have a strong contrast between the seasons. And in particular, at that time, you have hotter summers and uh, colder winters, as you get closer to the mid-latitudes. And finally, the last thing that happens is that you have the axis, like a spinning top, the axis of rotation of the Earth that spins around the perpendicular of the plane of the orbit. Which means that since you have a perihelion and a aphelion, well, you show alternatively the head or the buttocks, that is the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, at the closest or at the furthest from the sun, right? So with a quasi-periodicity of 20,000 years, you have rather the northern hemisphere when you are closest to the sun, which looks at the sun, or rather the southern hemisphere, okay? Either one or the other. And that changes with a quasi-periodicity of 20,000 years. When you put it all together, you have notably something which varies greatly. It is the insulation at 65 degrees north. So you might tell me, insulation at 65 degrees north, why are we suddenly interested in that? So why? Because it is the very sensitive area which conditions the entry into glaciation or exit in, of, of glaciation during the Quaternary Era. Because it is a place where, with the variations of these astronomical parameters, you can have a very large variation of insulation that is received, especially in summer. The more the axis straightens, the less contrast there is between the seasons. And therefore, at this time, the summer is proportionally less hot. The summer is proportionally less hot. And when you are close enough to the pole so that it still snows in the winter, at this time you have the snow which doesn't want to melt much in the summer, and snow begins to accumulate year after year and you enter into glaciation. All right. So, in fact, one of the conditions for entering glaciation is the fact that the axis straightens on the plane of the orbit. And correlatively, when it tilts, it's the opposite. You have very hot summer and it starts to melt. So you have here variations in insulation that go with the entries and exits of the last glaciations, which are illustrated here. In all these parameters, there is one that is today has become the dominant parameter. So, sorry, I'll have to stop 30 seconds to find the little animation that goes well. There we go. Here you have a little animation made by the only people who count in this world, that is to say the champagne producers. And the worst part is that it's true. They made me this little animation in 2002 for a conference, which tries to explain what the di dynamics, let's say, of the greenhouse effect consists of, which is one of the processes at work in the um, climate formation. So here you have a simplified illustration of the Earth's surface made up of emerged soils and water oceans, and the energy input that allows the climate machine to operate, that is to say solar energy. Since the climate machine is like all machines of the world, it is subject to the first law of thermodynamics. So for her to do something, it needs energy. And that energy is essentially brought by solar radiation. So this solar radiation, when it arrives on the surface of the atmosphere, you have basically a third that is reflected towards space by all that is shiny as seen from space. So if you look at a satellite photo of the Earth, you have two types of surfaces which are particularly shiny, which are snow that you will definitely find and then deserts absolutely so you have snow and deserts which are particularly reflective
So that drains you about a third of the incident solar energy. The remaining two thirds, since they are not reflected, are absorbed, in particular absorbed by the ground. So then the soil, like in, um, let's say, uh, like in any energy system, will get the energy which is that which it absorbs in the form of light radiation, or rather electromagnetic radiation to be more precise, because let's say 50% of solar radiation is infrared, and there's only 40% visible and 10% ultraviolet. So the soil absorbing the solar energy will seek to put itself in energetic equilibrium, him as well, and the ground has three ways of reaching energy balance, that is to say, to restore in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in stationary regime the energy supplied to it by the sun. The first way it has is contact heat. So you are above a warm ground, you put air on top of it, the heat is transferred directly by contact. This is the first way in which the ground restores energy. A second way in which the soil restores energy, so it isn't very well represented here, but you can still see it with this little flashy blue thing, it's the latent heat of water, evaporation condensation. So when you heat the ground, two thirds of which happens to be water, because two thirds of the planet is covered of water, well, you will evaporate water, and there you have latent heat, which is used for the evaporation, which is returned to the atmosphere. And you will have a third mode of energy um, return, which is that the ground will radiate infrared, because you remember that anybody above zero Kelvin radiates, so the sun whose surface is at 6000 Kelvin has a spectrum in which there is a lot of visible radiation, a lot of infrared and a little ultraviolet. Earth, which is on average at 300 Kelvins in order of magnitude, well, a little more, 310, has a spectrum that is much longer, shifted to wavelengths that are much more important, and in these longer wavelengths, there's essentially what is called far infrared, which is, by the way, roughly the same infrared radiation as the one you emit, which allows you to be seen by an infrared camera, or which allows you to watch the infrared rays escaping from the thermal strainer in which you live, if so. All that is in the same wavelengths. And it turns out that the atmosphere, which is perfectly transparent to the incident solar rays, except for... What doesn't go through the atmosphere? Ultraviolets, yes, which are intercepted by a chemical species that you find in the stratosphere, which is called ozone. Well, with the exception of this interception, most of the solar radiation passes through the atmosphere unhindered, while the radiation re-emitted by the planet, and it is indeed re-emitted, not reflected, as I sometimes find in your exams, well, this is far infrared for which the atmosphere will contain species which are very strongly opaque for these infrareds. And very strongly opaque, that means which have absorption lines in the far infrared. And in fact, a greenhouse gas, that's the definition, it is a gas that has absorption lines in the far infrared emitted by the planet. Since the atmosphere is... Does this thing work? Yeah is essentially opaque to these infrared, it will absorb the energy of these infrared, since it intercepts them. Same motive, same punishment, the atmosphere will also seek to reach energy balance and to get rid of the energy it absorbs when it is in energy balance. It has only one means at her disposal, she cannot evaporate water or any of that, all it can do is re radiate infrared. And so what happens is that when you intercept the infrared emitted from the surface, you intercept them, you re-emit them, and you're going to re-emit them in all directions. So some of it goes towards space and will end up putting the planet in energy balance as seen from space. But another part returns to the ground and therefore contributes to a second heating of the ground after the direct solar radiation heating. So in terms of watts per square meter, the infrared radiation from the greenhouse effect is almost as important as the solar radiation, but since I don't remember who said that T is proportional to sigma times temperature to the power of 4, obviously it does not double the equilibrium temperature of the soil, but it increases it by 30 degrees Celsius. So if the natural greenhouse effect did not exist, good news for you, this course wouldn't take place, but bad news, you wouldn't exist because the Earth would be too far away from the triple point of water for life to take place, at least not life as we know it.
All right, so the natural greenhouse effect is a very good thing. It has enabled the emergence of life, and by the way, by a kind of magic of balancing processes, the natural greenhouse effect has decreased as the solar power has increased, because since the solar star was formed, its power has increased, and there was a sort of correlative evolution of both greenhouse effect and solar power, which means that the temperature of the planet has never gotten really far away from the triple point of water, rather, below, it has never gotten below the triple point of water everywhere. So the... Uh, there you go. It's something quite remarkable, we can say. It works. At this point, we come. So we come and the story I told you in the first lesson, that is to say we arrive with our machines, our cows, and our one, then two, then three, then five, then seven, then eight billion bipeds. And in doing so, we are going to initiate activities that create additional emissions of greenhouse gas. In fact, greenhouse gas emissions, the planet does it on its own as well, but we are adding more. And since these greenhouse gases have the nasty habit of not wanting to escape quickly out of the atmosphere once we put them there, I'll get back to that, well, at this time, we will increase the atmospheric gas concentration of greenhouse gas. So, we will increase the opacity of the atmosphere to the infrared radiation emitted by the planet, and if we increase the opacity of the atmosphere to the infrared radiation emitted by the planet, it means that we will intercept even better those emitted by the ground, and from this fact, we will warm even more the lower atmosphere, which will emit even more in all directions, including towards the ground. So, we will intensify the heating of the ground. So, the increase of the greenhouse effect generates an increase in the planetary surface temperature. As we increase the heating of the ground, then the ground will do what it knew how to do with the initial solar radiation. That is to say, it will increase every term. There, it will increase every term of the energy return from the ground to the atmosphere. So we will increase the contact heat, we will increase the evaporation condensation, and we will increase the infrared radiation emitted, and we will increase it until that, what manages to pass through the atmosphere, what is called the atmospheric window, has become again identical to what we had before, increasing the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. In other words, we will return to the energy balance as seen from space, but in the meantime, we have intensified the energy flows between the ground and the lower atmosphere. So when you see this little animation, yes? They don't hold them back, they absorb them. They absorb them and re-emit them. It is a absorption re-emission phenomena. The infrareds that come from the sun are short infrared wavelengths. They're not the same, okay? This is what we call the near infrared. Infrared is anything that goes beyond the visible. So this is not uh, something that is very extremely precise in terms of, anyways, so we are used to classifying them as near infrared, those that are close to the visible spectrum in the same orders of magnitude of wavelength, and in distant infrareds, those, those that are much farther away. What you immediately understand by watching this animation is that convective movements or more exactly, extreme phenomena which originates in convective movements, will do something, so to say. The extreme phenomena which have their origin in convective movements, you have hurricanes, so you know that a hurricane starts with an important convection, with uh, an ocean surface temperature which must be high, so that you have a lot of evaporation. You have thunderstorms, you have tornadoes, and all these phenomena, you understand that the engine will increase because the surface heats up, evaporation increases, but correlatively, as a growing share of the terrestrial infrareds are absorbed near the surface, they are less to warm up the stratosphere. In fact, we will see this in the next class. One of the marks of the greenhouse effect is that the surface temperature increases, but the stratosphere temperature decreases. So you will increase the temperature gradient, of the lower layer of the atmosphere, the so-called troposphere, the first 10 kilometers, and if you increase the temperature gradient, you will increase the convective power. So you will necessarily, because of the process involved, change the dynamics of extreme events or intense meteorological phenomena. So, I come back...
Mm. There. Right. So, once uh, I've explained to you what the greenhouse effect is, to understand what is coming, there is something that you need to know, which is that to understand climate change under the effect of human activities does not result from a single scientific discipline. In the press, we often see here and there the term climatologist. And so when we see that, we say to ourselves, a climatologist is a specialist on climate evolution. So in fact, a specialist on climate change does not exist as such. At no time has there been a discipline called specialist of climate change as a result of human activities. What has happened is that over the last 30 years, there has been an agency to aggregate the skills of a whole bunch of people who were created under the aegis of the United Nations, which is called IPCC or GIEC in French, which means International Panel on Climate Change, and in French we translate that to Groupe Intergouvernemental sur l'évolution du climat, which consists of asking researchers to put uh, together the findings of a whole bunch of scientific disciplines to give a global vision of this problem, that is, the evolution of climate under the effect of human activities. But it's not just a single scientific discipline. So, for example, I told you that the planetary climate is changing under the effect of extraction of the planets. Well, you need astrophysicists to understand celestial mechanics, and even without the other planets besides, you need them. You need atmospheric dynamists, they are not the same. You need atmospheric chemists, they are not the same. You need oceanographers, they are still not the same, etc. So you need a whole bunch of... Um, and for those of you who have, for example, heard of a man called Jean Jouzel, Jean Jouzel is better placed in the category of glaciologists. He did his thesis on the isotopic content of oxygen-18, if my memory is good, in hailstones. So that's where he came from. So, there you go. You need a whole bunch of specialists, and it took a tour de force from the scientific community to ask all these people to speak to each other, to give with one voice, with a one-stop shop for access to information called the IPCC, a vision of what climate change was under human activities. So why am I telling you this? Because when you go to interview a scientist in the press, none of them has, because of his work, and I said because of his work, a view at all of these disciplines. He can have one with his readings, it is obviously not forbidden to him as to you, but it's not his work that will give him an expertise of the same level on everything that is mentioned here. So I stress this because it's important to know that you don't, again, have climatologists. It is something that does not exist. So sometimes we give the um, the closest meaning to climatologists that we can find in the scientific community is a modeler. The climatologist is the one that makes the model that integrates the skills of all his colleagues. There. In the end, it's the least bad definition, but it's still something that is uh, important to keep in mind. So, I told you that I always mix up 1824 and 1826. Well, there you go, the answer. So, it's 1824, the correct date, and therefore 1826, the shale gases in eastern United States. So, in 1824, the greenhouse effect was identified by Joseph Fourier, you have heard of Joseph Fourier, a tiny bit. So our friend publishes an article in which he says there is something in the atmosphere which causes ground temperatures to be higher than if this something did not exist. So two centuries ago, almost to a few years, there is a French scientist, French pride, who understands that ground temperatures are increased by the role of the atmosphere you have a few decades later a French, again, then an Irish, who identify the two main greenhouse gases that we have in the atmosphere, which are carbon dioxide and water vapor. So, in fact, the fact that there is a greenhouse effect and that it is caused at first order by, by water vapor and carbon dioxide is known since over a century and a half ago. In 1896, a Swede, Mr. Arrhenius, who happens to be, since she is of your generation, one of Greta Thunberg's ancestors. I mean, Sweden is a small country, so they may all be someone's ancestor. So, who happens to be one of her ancestors, in his spare time, because he could not watch TV at the time, 
he does a little calculation of orders of magnitude on what happens if we double the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. And so Mr. Arrhenius says two or three things that are absolutely fundamental. He says, one, if I double the amount of CO2 in the air, the planetary temperature rises on average by four degrees Celsius. So in 1896, there is a first calculation of order of magnitudes that falls on the right result. It would seem a little by luck, told me Hervé Le Trout, but still. And two, and besides, Arrhenius understands, probably because of black body radiation, by the way, that if we have an additional greenhouse effect, that is to say, additional interception of terrestrial infrared, which you have everywhere on the surface of the planet, well, the resulting temperature increase, all other things being equal, will be even greater if the starting temperature is low. Meaning that for the same power radiated back to the ground, the more the starting temperature is low, the higher the temperature rise because of temperature to the power of 4 in the black body formula. So Arrhenius said at that time something which is perfectly true and which allows us today to say that it is indeed the greenhouse effect that is at work, which is that it will increase faster at the poles. I mean, if there is more greenhouse effects, the temperature rise will be faster at the poles than at the tropics, which is very exactly what is happening. That it will rise faster at night than during the day, which is also happening. That it will rise faster in winter than in summer, which is also happening. So Arrhenius understood these two things in 1896, both that it will go up by 4 degrees and that the spatial structure of this temperature rise has a particular signature, which is the one we will find today. So, you know the English are a bit crazy, that's why they're creative, they are both conservative and crazy. And so, almost a century ago, there is an Englishman who imagines doing a digital simulation, but at the time there was no computer, so since there was no computer, he said, I'm going to take physicists, or I don't know, all the engineers from this university. Anyway, so he said, I'm going, like an orchestra, to control them all with my baton, to make them solve the equations in a unitary fashion, one behind the other. Obviously, it doesn't work, but as soon as the first computer is developed, and you will see some of its characteristics in one of the next courses, well, some physicists jump on it to make the first simulation model of the behavior of the atmosphere. So the idea that we can use digital tools, that is to say models, to try and figure out what will happen later, it did not appear with the latest version of video games. It's something that is very, very old in terms of uh, climate science as well. There is one thing that I didn't put in this timeline and that I should have, and I'll come back to it later, which is the moment when we discovered mass spectrometers, which allow isotope analyses, since these isotope analyses are absolutely crucial to reconstruct the temperatures of the past. So there is another extremely important date, which is the 70s. It is from this moment on that we are able to analyze sediments, or in general samples taken here and there on the Earth's crust, including the famous polar ice. And with isotope analyses, reconstruct markers of past climate. That's in the 70s. So, I told you, a greenhouse gas has an extremely simple definition. It is a gas which has absorption lies in the terrestrial infrared. This is the definition of a greenhouse gas. It turns out that this physical property is only accessible to gases which are triatomic or more, so diatomic or monoatomic gases, meaning a noble gas, uh, cannot have absorption lines in the terrestrial infrared. So oxygen is transparent to the terrestrial infrared, nitrogen is transparent to the terrestrial infrared, and argon too. On the other hand, you have water vapor, triatomic, which has absorption lines. You have carbon dioxide, triatomic, which has absorption lines. You have methane, which has five atoms, which has absorption lines. Nitrogen oxide, which also has absorption lines. And we'll come back to all of this. And gases, which are pure Lego, invented by men, which we call halocarbons. These are hydrocarbons in which we have substituted all or part of a hydrogen by a halogen molecule, so therefore chlorine, fluoride, bromine, etc. We'll see why we do that. Which are also extremely powerful greenhouse gases. And finally, there is one last gas, which is a greenhouse gas, which is ozone. Ozone is the Swiss army knife of absorption. It does everything. Uh, it absorbs terrestrial infrareds, or it knows how to absorb terrestrial infrareds, to be more precise. And it also knows how to absorb the sun's ultraviolets. All right? It does everything. Wonderful.
I told you, the greenhouse effect is something natural on Earth since you have two gases naturally present in the atmosphere which are greenhouse gases, so water vapor and CO2, um, and methane too, sorry. So you have greenhouse effect on Earth since you have in the atmosphere CO2, methane and water vapor. That is to say since four and a half billion years. The early atmosphere of the Earth was notably formed by volcanic activity, which led to a large degassing of CO2. So in the primitive atmosphere of the Earth, you already have CO2. So the greenhouse effect is a story old of four and a half billion years on Earth. By the way, this greenhouse effect, as it is due to vol primary volcanic activity, we have another planet which has also formed an atmosphere in which there is a lot, a, tell a telluric planet. It has a density of matter which is close to ours, which is Venus. So Venus presumably had a primitive atmosphere which formed like ours, except that since Venus did not have life, it never had the atmospheric changes that we have experienced on Earth, with first the appearance of methane due to the primitive bacteria called archaea, then the appearance of oxygen with the primitive then more developed plants which ate CO2 and which um, created oxygen. So the atmosphere of Venus still has 90 to 95% of CO2, and on the surface of Venus, with 90 to 95% of CO2, you have a pretty cozy greenhouse effect since the surface temperature exceeds 400 degrees. The difference between Venus and Earth is also that the angle of interception of Venus is more important, since Venus is closer to the Sun. But if you look at the impact of this larger intercept angle, so the fact that Venus is closer to the Sun, on the equilibrium temperature, you will only find a few tens of degrees. So good news for you, this is not the exercise that will give you for the end of this course. So it does not explain why you have 400 degrees more compared to the planetary temperature. What explains these 400 degrees more, for the most part, is the greenhouse effect of Venus Extremely powerful, since you have, I repeat, more than 90% of CO2 in the atmosphere. So I don't think that you will ever see this in your lifetime, or neither will I, for that matter. However, it is just there to show that the int intensification of the greenhouse effect can very, very strongly change the climate of the planet. It can very st strongly change it. Men has therefore an action today on the atmospheric composition. And the way you, he has this action is through his greenhouse gas emissions. So the first most important greenhouse gas we emit, and I'll tell you later how we calculate the importance, is carbon dioxide or CO2. Carbon dioxide, you have here, it's five planetary causes which are of human origin. First is deforestation. Why does deforestation emit CO2? What is deforestation in practice? Yeah? So when we deforest, it means we eliminate the forest. So there were trees and we cut them. Then what do we do with it? Mostly we burn them, yeah. So the largest part of deforestation is clearing, that is to say we cut the forest to install agricultural surfaces, but even when the cut wood is used, in fact only a small part of the wood, that will live a long time. In a French forest, you have only 7% of a cut tree that is long-lived lumber. Everything else it will go into products that will either have a very short lifespan, typically paper, packaging, etc., or have a reasonably short lifespan, typically the IKEA piece of furniture that will not survive for... Well, in general, the IKEA furniture is not going to outlive you, so there. So it goes into products that are relatively short-lived, and once the product has ended its life, the carbon ends up back into the atmosphere because, in general, it is burnt, yes? Yes, it is completely negligible. So there you will find two things. It is at the same time the carbon that was contained into the tree which will end up into the atmosphere because again, it is essentially burnt. I'll answer your questions in two seconds. And the second thing that you will find is that when you transform forest soil into agricultural soil, you are going to plow, 
By plowing, you expose the humus to oxygen in the air, and therefore you will destock carbon by accelerated oxidation. So you decrease the carbon content of the soil, and it's these two processes added together that cause the CO2 emissions coming from deforestation. Yes? Ah, uh, on the y-axis you have millions of tons, so these are billions of tons. So if you remove the three zeros, you have billions of tons. Yes, sorry, I should have clarified. So you have here deforestation. What you can notice is that deforestation has passed through a form of maximum a few decades ago, and it still continues and is very important. But the reason why you have large fluctuations here when you didn't have any before is just that now we have statistics. I mean, it's a screening bias, basically. So we have statistics of shorter time steps than those we had before. So before it's moved out. Moreover, assessing deforestation statistically is a problem much more complicated than it seems because it is essentially done with satellite observation. But if you deforest on a parcel which is below the resolution, below the pixel of the image, you don't see it. If you remove every other tree and that the crowns of the trees remain pretty much like they were before, you can't see it. So there are plenty of things that you may not see on satellite imagery. So knowing exactly how many trees we cut down may be more complicated than it seems. Then you have here a second term, which is carbon dioxide that comes from the use of coal. So using coal, like petroleum, like gas, refer to what I told you last time, is an exothermic reaction caused by oxidation. So you take a compound of carbon and hydrogen, it's called a hydrocarbon, in variable proportions, a lot of carbon solid, medium carbon liquids, little carbon gaseous, and you oxidize it. And it gives you an exothermic reaction which will allow you to feed machines. So that's the carbon dioxide that comes from coal, oil and gas. And then there's a thing called lime calcination, and in French, calcination du calcaire. So calcination of limestone, why do we do such a thing? To make cement, absolutely. So, limestone, what's the formula of limestone? CaCO3. Cement is basically quick lime, CaO, with a whole bunch of fairy dust that you add to the misc, a little bit of clay, a little bit of marl, a little bit of whatever. And that's why... Uh, who, who has ever done masonry here? Well, you have noticed that if you don't put any gloves on, at the end of the day, your finger skin is all messed up. Because cement, as it is quicklime plus fairy dust, it attacks you, it's an oxidant. So, yeah, it attacks your skin. So, hydraulic binders in general attack your skin. To make CaO from CaCO3, it's very simple. You take a large pair of scissors and you cut it in half. So you take CaCO3, you put CaO on one side and CO2 on the other. So what is this big pair of scissors which allows you to break the molecule in two? It's called a kiln, in which you bring the limestone to a little over a thousand degrees. So like in The Incredibles, a thousand degrees. So you get on one side the CaO and on the other the CO2. Obviously the CO2, you don't do anything with it, so it just goes into the atmosphere. And what you have here under lime calcination, it is the CO2 from the cement kilns that comes from this rupture of the calcium carbonate molecule in half. It does not include the CO2 from the energy you need to heat the oven. That is not in it. It is in addition. There is just the lime calcination. So here I give you a view by source. And now I will give you a view according to zones. It's a little longer for a time scale, since here we start at 1750, you weren't born, neither was I. Do so you see that at that time emissions, there weren't that many, we're still a little, still a few. And we will look at how emissions evolve over time. So what you see is that you have here in blue emissions of formerly industrialized countries, here OECD countries, which increase, which increase, which increase, and which tend since the energy peak of which I spoke the um, uh, penultimate time, so to stabilize here. Here, in yellow, you have the old communist bloc. This is what we call economies in transition. Here, in green, you have Asia, and in particular, China. And you can see that today, it has overtaken the OECD area, but that went extremely fast. And finally, in orange and brown, you have other countries. You can also see that, um, there, that, uh, that there are some small indentations on this curve. So you can see the recession of 1929, you see what it gives you in annual change, meaning uh, you can see a downward, downward stroke. 
and in trend, which is not much. Keep in mind, however, that both the crisis of 29, well, more exactly at its paroxysm, meaning the year 1932, and the paroxysm of the Second World War, that means the industrial eradication of Germany and Japan in 1945, these are the only two episodes in the 20th century when the annual emissions declined 4% or more. There were two years during the 20th century where the annual emissions decreased by 4%, it's 1932 and 1945. So remember, because if we are serious on the Paris Agreement, we should do this every year from now on, starting next week until you're my age. Every year. We must make every year in the world an effort that is of the same order of magnitude as what we obtained during these two years. Don't laugh, it'll be up to you to do it. Here you have an oil shock. So you see, uh, I won't repeat what President Chirac said, but I'm thinking about it very strongly. Here you have a little recession, it didn't last very long. There you have a very strong growth, which is the industrial takeoff of China. And on the other hand, you have here something that is very effective in lowering the emissions, which is the economic collapse of communist countries after the fall of the wall. It works very, very well. And you'll see next time that, unfortunately, it works very, very well, means that this could ultimately work to respect the fact that the world is finite. Because for the moment, we, could, we have a drama in the story, which is this. I showed you in the first lesson that more GDP actually means more productive flow, that the flow was by definition measured by energy, so that meant more energy. And since energy is essentially fossil, that means more CO2. So what you see on this graph is the drama of the climate negotiations. It's the tragedy, as the famous quote goes, because making less CO2 emissions so massively today, nobody knows, not even me, how to conceive that without making a significant drop in GDP. No one knows how to do that today. And we'll come back to this, but basically nobody knows how to do that. So the drama of climate negotiations is there. And I don't know who in this room knows Brice Lalonde. The tool, people in the back. <laughs> Just kidding. So Brice Lalonde was an ecologist candidate. So he did his few percent of votes in France at a time when not only were you not born, but I was not old. He was France's climate ambassador and he was notably in Copenhagen. Well, we were in Copen together in Copenhagen in 2009 and he went to all the cops. So very simple. And moreover, if the students who organize conferences here want to invite him to a conference one day, he is a very good speaker and he has very colorful and vivid ways of telling a billion anecdotes. And so Brice said one day, knowing he's done all the cops from the start, he said, the problem with the climate negotiations is that from the start, the Western countries come thinking we're going to talk about climate and the developing countries come thinking we're going to talk about development and development wins. There. Because, as I um, remind you here, because it's not a demonstration, it's a reminder, today we do not know how to make more GDP without using more machines and therefore more energy, and so... Pfft, we will see in the coming lessons if we can only use low carbon energy and you'll see that it's not that simple. Here you have the trajectory of CO2 emissions in France. So you see that in long series, well, we are more or less like the others. It was small, it has increased, there were accidents, etc. None of the accidents really prevent the increase as long as the economic output grows. There is one thing though that did come the game down. It's the French nuclear program, which you can see here. However, now emissions, as soon as we have the opportunity to grow the GDP, which is what we would like to do if we were at the government at the moment, we don't manage that well, but it's not because we want to, well, the emissions tend to start increasing again as well. This graph comes from the last ICC, IPCC report, and it gives the um, counterpart, I would say, of the variation in emissions over the last four decades as a function of, it's the Kaya equation actually. So who here already knows the Kaya equation? No one? Good. So you won't be too bored next time. So the, uh, the Kaya equation is an equation that breaks down the CO2 emissions into four terms that are respectively population, GDP per person, the energy intensity of GDP, and the CO2 efficiency of energy. 
And what those four bars here say is that you've had a variation rate of emissions always positive. So a growth in emissions over the last four decades, which is the uh, triangle you have there. But it breaks down into an improvement in the energy efficiency of the economy, which is the yellow bar, an improvement in the carbon efficiency of the economy over the first three decades of this graph, but not the last decade. Uh, as you can see here, it deteriorates. In fact, it's the industrial boom of China and the boom of coal. And uh, you have the two other terms, which are population and production per person. In other words, the more we are, all other things being equal, the more we emit. It's uh, unfortunately arithmetic. And also, the more we create physical flows based on machines per person, that is, the more GDP we create per person, the more energy we use. And since the energy is fossil, the more we emit. So, in other words, over the past four decades, the demographic growth and the increase of environmental transformation per person, that's the GDP per person, have gone faster than the gains that your predecessors from the same school were able to do in machines that we use to live, that is to say the amount of CO2 that we put in the air when using a kilowatt hour, and the quantity of machines or the quantity of kilowatt hours that we must use to make a dollar of added value. All right, these two technical parameters have constantly changed more slowly in the good direction than the two parameters that push emissions up have evolved in the other direction. Small zoom on deforestation. You see that the areas that have been deforested are not the same depending on the time. You see in particular that a century and a half ago, the world champion of deforestation was North America. Today, the world champion of deforestation is more Southeast Asia, after it has been Latin America for a long time. However, there is still deforestation in many countries in the world. Deforestation has two very simple determinants. The first, since we deforest to increase the arable land, the first uh, determinant is the size of the population. So the more the population grows, the more we deforest. Very simple. And the second determinant is the more meat a diet has, the more you will need large agriculture areas to feed the animals that you're going to eat instead of directly eating the plants that grow. And so the more area you have per person, or rather, the more you need an important area per person, which is obviously taken where it can be taken, that is to say, in the forest. So I'm going to say it in a more summarized and blunt way. There are two drivers, two essential determinants of deforestation. It is the increase of the population and the increase of the meat content in the diet. So there, these are the two essential determinants of deforestation. I showed, yes, because there was less stuff to cut. So in Europe, the minimum forest coverage, I said it during the first lesson, it was 15% coverage of the European surface in 1850. And uh, we stopped deforestation because essentially there was nothing more to cut because 15% is pretty much give or take the forests that cover the mountains, the very high latitudes, etc. Basically, where you don't want to go and put things to grow. But all of Bos has been deforested, the entire Aquitaine plain has been deforested, the land forest has re was replanted afterwards. But So essentially, what when you have all the plains that are occupied, you stop. With a few exceptions, of course, but basically that's it. There was another question? Okay, yeah. In other words, when you find a balance between the population in the arable areas, you stop deforesting. So either this equilibrium is found by limitation, let's say by starvation. So at some point, the arable surfaces and the yields mean that you cannot increase the size of the population. So you have deforested everything that could be deforested except mountain and things like that. Well, actually, even that you can deforest a little, put crops in terraces like in the seven. Um, or the point of equilibrium is before. And so especially in the United States, one of the things that also, so to say, saves the forests are tractors and fertilizers. Because when you increase the crop yield per hectare, you don't have to go looking for services elsewhere. And by the way, when we say that we have to do extensive agriculture, it brings back the problem of deforestation.
since if you have the same diet from a lesser productive surface, you need more surface area. So here you have an obvious use conflict, actually more of an objective conflict to be exact, between three things which are meat production, phytosanitary slash fertilizers and deforestation. So it's a complicated thing. Here you have another way of looking at greenhouse gas emissions, which are not the greenhouse gas emissions um, of the population as a whole, but which are the greenhouse gas emissions per person. So per person, you are going to tell me, well, it's obvious, it was extremely weak at the start of the industrial era and exploded afterwards. If you look at the CO2 that comes from the fossil fuels, yes, since the marker of the industrial era is precisely to have used machines that eat fossil fuels. If you add the CO2 from deforestation, you then see that you completely change the picture. In a century and a half, CO2 emissions per person have been multiplied in quotes only by two and a half, only by two and a half, while over the same period, the human population has been multiplied by uh, six or five. So you can see that the CO2 emissions per person have increased, but uh, emissions linked to deforestation have fallen sharply, and obviously the others made up for that decrease. Small zoom on France. Here you have the tricolor CO2 emissions. Not only tricolored like our flag, but there are really three colors on this graph. You notice that today they are lower than they were at the time of the first oil shock. We have less CO2 emissions. And you see in particular that those of petroleum and coal have strongly decreased. The petroleum was driven out of industrial uses and partially out of heating by gas and electricity. Coal has been driven out of industrial uses for two reasons. The first is that once France had finished building its infrastructure, we needed to produce less steel, and one of the big coal consumers is the steel industry. We made less electricity from coal, this is the second reason, and we used less in the industry. On the other hand, you see that the gas tended to increase its CO2 emissions. In fact, it has ceased, ceased to be true since the mid-2000s. Therefore, you see that there, we still have a strong trend on this chart. So when you... Yes? These are gross emissions. There is no absorption of forests in there. These are really the gross emissions. The, the counting of sinks is an indescribable thing, and I'll talk about it quickly, but it's a very complicated thing. So, the gross CO2 emissions, what I wanted to show you is that in France they tend to decline since uh, the oil shocks. If, uh, oh, and by the way, if you see in the newspaper, ah, the emissions have increased compared to last year. In the view of the long series that I show you here, what can you deduce from it? No, you don't infer anything. <laughs> When you are watching a uh, long uh, series evolution, you see that there are little things that go up, little things that go down, little things that go up, little things that go down, etc. When you have this kind of stuff, the only conclusion that you can get out of it is nothing. It does not prevent people who want to give you news to tell you that ah, it's because of this, it's because of that, it's because of something, etc. In fact, over a year, you essentially get the conclusion that let's wait and see. So it's obviously annoying what I'm telling you because in a world that is ruled by short-term reaction, not being able to attribute precise causes to what we are observing is annoying. So here you have the same thing discriminated by sector of use. So there are a few things that are quite uh, striking on this graph. Firstly, you see that the order in which the emissions arrive today is absolutely not the order in which they arrived uh, at the time of the maximum at the oil shock. At, the, at that time, most of the use, I mean, of CO2 emissions was the work of industry and not at all of transport as it is the case today. You can see that the CO2 emissions of industry starting the oil shocks fell sharply, which is another way of saying that industry is the sector in which the consumption is most price sensitive. And do you know why? Because as brilliant of a mean Paris Tech University engineer as you are, in your personal life you will count much less carefully what you do than in your professional life. 
So in personal life, people are much less sensitive, despite to what you're taught in economics. We are not just rational beings, and therefore you are much less sensitive to price variations than one can be in companies where we make lots of extremely clever calculations to know if we cannot win three cents here rather than lose two there. And this is the reason why the industrial sector is much more sensitive to price changes than the private sector. It reacts faster. And moreover, you can see that the same variation in oil prices applied to the industry here is a game changer well, there it hardly changes anything, right? Oil consumption in transport evolved before and after pretty much the same way. After you have a second place where it starts to move significantly, these are the energy industries, that is electric power plants and refineries, and this is essentially the work of electric power plants. We had more and more coal, oil and gas in the power plants, and now we have less and less, especially oil, and we start to replace everything with nuclear. You see the effect here. You also see it in buildings. So residential and, um, and, uh, and tertiary, actually in the boilers of buildings to be exact, it also starts to decrease. And the only sector in which it has continued to increase is transport. However, you see that in transport it tends to decrease since the mid-2000s. And this is not due to climate awareness because it is an effect that is seen in all other European countries at about the same time, it is an effect on, of the regional stress in liquid hydrocarbon supply, of which I told you in the previous course. It's an effect of that. If we take all greenhouse gases combined, this is how it is uh, distributed. So you still have transport that comes first. But on the other hand, if you look carefully, you see here agriculture that is all the way down and here agriculture going much higher. I won't go into the details at the moment because I'll come back to it after, but it is linked to the fact that it emits other gases than just the uh, CO2. What is it? Is it the theater club next door? So I'm just going to ask him to do a little less noise or close the door, actually. Yeah, I think we should solve the problem. Uh, so let's come back to the matter at hand. The amount of CO2 in the air is increasing, I showed you earlier. I'll come back to it later by explaining how this is measured over long periods. This increasing amount of CO2, we have a natural cause that could lead to its increase. I mentioned this earlier, which is... It is because that has made CO2 appear in the Earth's early atmosphere. Yes, volcanism. If the CO2 appears in the air from volcanism, at the moment when I have an increase of the quantity of CO2 in the air, do I have a particular reason for observing a correlative decrease in the oxygen content? Yes or no? No. What you see here is the variation in the amount of CO2 in the air with, in fact, the seasonal variation. And here you have the variation in the amount of oxygen in the air. This is obviously an extremely expanded scale. And you see that there is also a seasonal variation. So do you know what the seasonal variation is? No. You still have the right to call a friend and 50-50, yeah? No, it's uh, seasonal, so not day and night. Yeah, exactly. So you know that the Earth has two hemispheres which are very asymmetrical with regards to emerged surfaces. You have a lot more emerged surfaces in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere, which means that when it is springtime in the northern hemisphere and where plants are growing, Growing vegetation will pump CO2 from the atmosphere, while on the other side, in the southern hemisphere, you have a lot less plants which, um, with a deciduous foliage that will have leaves that will rot, meaning that the CO2 will return to the atmosphere because, in fact, a rotting leaf is a leaf that decomposes under microbial action and microbes breathe like you do, so microbial respiration puts some CO2 back into the atmosphere like you microbes absorb oxygen and they release CO2. So when it's spring and summer in the northern hemisphere, the contents in CO2 of a planetary atmosphere tends to slightly drop, 
And on the other hand, when it's autumn and winter in the northern hemisphere, the CO2 content of the atmosphere tends to slightly re-increase. And so around a major trend, which is driven by our emissions of CO2, you have a uh, seasonal oscillation, which you see very, very well in the measures on the CO2 content. If the seasonal variation goes correlatively with a seasonal oscillation of oxygen, and that, uh, and that moreover, the heavy trend of oxygen is a slight drop in its concentration, it means that any CO2 molecule that appears in the air has taken an oxygen molecule from the air. We agree? And so that means that this CO2 could only appear by oxidation of a carbon that was available to be oxidized. And you have two places where carbon is available to be oxidized. You have the vegetation, decomposition of dead leaves, but you also have, and this is a trend, the combustion of fossil fuels. And it is normal that the combustion of fossil fuels takes away, or you destock the carbon from under the ground, and correlatively, you will destock a little oxygen from the atmosphere. And you put the two together, and it gives you more CO2. So what this curve on oxygen tells you is that it is indeed a combustion process, or carbon oxidation to be more precise, which is at the origin of the appearance of the CO2 surplus in the air. This is one of the ways that we have to show that the, uh, the surplus of CO2 that appears in the atmosphere is indeed coming from something happening at the surface of a planet, not, for example, from volcanism. There is a second analysis that we are able to do on this CO2, which shows that it indeed comes from us. It's, uh, have you heard of a carbon-14? So carbon-14, do you know how it is formed? It forms by transmutation of nitrogen in the upper atmosphere under the effects of cosmic radiation. So under the effect of cosmic radiation, you have nitrogen in the upper atmosphere, which absorbs, I don't remember if it's a neutron or a proton, but it has an indigestion and it turns into carbon-14. This carbon-14 afterwards enters the carbon cycle and will be ingested by living beings. When you have fossil fuels that are ancient living beings, they've been underground for tens of millions of years, they totally lost their carbon-14. So the CO2 emissions that come from fossil fuels must deplete the atmosphere in carbon-14. All right, what comes from life is a short-lived carbon-14 cycle. The tree grows, it lasts a few decades or a few centuries, it dies, bam, it goes back into the atmosphere. It's too short of a time for it to change fundamentally the carbon-14 content of the atmosphere. On the other hand, when you destock fossil fuels and you add CO2, which itself is completely depleted of carbon-14, it changes the azotopic content of the atmosphere in carbon-14. And it is also something that we're observing right now, and it's also something that allows us to say that the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere indeed comes from us. So I'm just going to skip that because I don't have the time and it's not the most important. Yes? Question? No. It is far too imperceptible. I said earlier, the scale is expanded. We are speaking of parts per million. So we are talking uh, for CO2 of making the CO2 content change from 0.03% to 0.04 or 0.05% of CO2 in the atmosphere. If you remove 0.01 or 0.02% of the oxygen from the atmosphere, it makes a partial pressure difference on the oxygen, which is much lower than when you go skiing and you have observed that you come back alive from skiing. Well, <laughs> until now, anyways. <laughs> so, and on that, Michael Schumacher was not that lucky. So, uh, this, uh, so, so this decrease in oxygen content is not sufficient for it to be a problem. On the other hand, the increase in the CO2 content of the atmosphere at higher levels than those we are talking about today, but not considerably higher, it can become a real problem. Today there are people who are looking at whether at 1000 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere we don't start to have recurring health problems for absolutely everyone. So today I remind you we're at 400. What is certain is that at 10% of CO2 in the atmosphere you all die since uh, there's an acute CO2 toxicity. And it's not just because you're choking. I can give you 20% of oxygen at the same time. It's just an acute toxicity. Therefore, CO2 in the atmosphere, it is better not to have too much of it.
you have also noticed, I'm sure, that when you're in a stale atmosphere, that is to say in a room that is not well ventilated, you can have a little headache. This is one of the possible effects of CO2. So I come back to it. CO2 is an oxide, carbon dioxide. You know it because you learned it in chemistry. That uh, oxides are molecules which are extremely stable. An oxide is very stable. The iron that we find today in the form of, um, of Fe2O3 in the uh, iron ore deposits, it has been billions of years, I mean, like, since the continents appeared and that the iron oxidized, it has been billions of years that it is in the form of iron oxide and it just stays like that because it's um, extremely stable. So this stability of CO2, this chemical stability, also applies to CO2 that we put in the atmosphere. Once the CO2 is put in the atmosphere, you do not have a chemical process to purge this gas. This, there, there is just no chemical process to purge CO2 from the atmosphere. You only have two cleansing processes, and I'll come back to that later, which are physical processes. CO2 can dissolve in ocean water. In fact, it is a balancing of partial pressures between the atmosphere and the ocean. And CO2 can be photosynthesized, meaning it can be absorbed, well, more exactly, metabolized by a plant, but it is an endothermic reaction, so you need a photon. So, spontaneously, you do not have a chemical reaction of CO2 with anything else in the atmosphere. The color corollary of this matter is that once the CO2 is put in the atmosphere, Actually, once the surplus of CO2 is put in the atmosphere, to be precise, it's amortization time, the time you need to wait for the excess of CO2 to evacuate after cessation of emissions is extremely high. So what you see here is that once you, um, once you stop emissions, so you wait and no more emissions, well, what this graph tells you is that a century later, you have 40 to 50 percent of the surplus, which is still above your head. So a century later, it's not even your heads, you will all be dead. A thousand years later, you will still have around 20 percent of the surplus that will still be above our heads. And 10,000 years later, you will still have around 10 percent of a surplus that will still be above our heads. So what I'm telling you is that the process of climate change has no reversibility, none, all right? There's no reset button that we'll be able to press one day while saying, shit, if I had known I wouldn't have come, and which uh, would make it possible to start over the experiment from the start. You can't just start over the experiment. It's an experiment that will be done once and only once. And because of this absolutely considerable inertia of CO2 in the atmosphere, Another thing that you can already keep in mind from now on is that the consequences of climate change, on which I will detail a number of things next time, the only guarantee that you have is that at the moment when we start to, I mean, we, you, humanity, the moment we will consider that they are intolerable, the only guarantee that we have from then on is that it will be worse afterwards. Because of the stability of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. All right? Yes? We put CO2 because we oxidize fossil fuels. Well, trees don't eat it fast enough because they are limited by photosynthesis. Yes, partially. And uh, then, in one of the consequences that I will tell you about, one of the consequences is that you will weaken terrestrial ecosystems. So, in addition, they will be less eager to eat CO2 than before. You have a certain number of feedback processes in this matter, which I will talk about next time, which are processes called positive, that is to say, of amplification, that is to say that the first consequences of a process will be to amplify the process. And you have a number of them, which I will detail next time. So here you obviously have a result of all the effects, its emissions, taking into account the fact that there are absorptions. So I said again, absorptions, you only have two, balancing of partial pressures between atmosphere and ocean, it's physical, an endothermic reaction of photosynthesis where you need a photon. So energy is required.
This matter will therefore apply to time scales that exceed understanding and above all, which exceed the characteristic time of electoral mandates in democracies and which, by the way, will go far beyond the long-term strategy of your future employer if it is listed in the stock exchange and either for that matter if it is not listed in the stock exchange. So the time horizons that are involved in this process, which I recall what I said at the beginning, are not accessible to your senses. I remind that, you know, I mean, uh, it's all averages. Well, the characteristic time of this process goes far, far beyond the characteristic time of the management methods that we have, let's say, democratized, excuse the pun, at the surface of the planet, that is, those that we have made common. So now, there is not only CO2 in life, there are other greenhouse gas emissions, I'll get to that, but CO2, in fact, when I tell you there's a part of the surplus that goes away, in fact, it remains for a while and after its concentration decreases more and more strongly. So you have other gases for which the instantaneous radiative effect is much stronger, but they can possibly stay for different timescales. And you have a gas in this matter, which is also important in discussions, which is methane. Methane has an instantaneous radiative forcing, which is much more important, meaning that when you put a kilogram of methane in the atmosphere, it intercepts much more efficiently terrestrial infrared than when you put a kilogram of CO2. On the other hand, methane has a chemical cleansing process out of the atmosphere. It is eaten by hydroxyl radicals, so it will stay for there for a shorter time. So it is the only gas that has a chemical cleansing process out of the atmosphere, the others don't. At this point, we know, because I showed you the graph earlier, that the amount of CO2, since we have instrumental measures, meaning since 1958, increases rapidly in the atmosphere, but we are not yet able to compare that with what, with what happened in more ancient times. So to compare that with more ancient periods, we will need to go for a little walk at the poles. So why are we, do we need to go to the poles? Because at the poles there is something that interests us a lot, as climate archives, which are the ice caps. So what is the process of formation of ice caps? We're going to take Antarctica, because what I'm telling you has ceased to be true for Greenland. Over most of the Antarctic surface, you have temperatures that are negative all year round, which means that when there are precipitations, it is necessarily in the form of snow. In any case, precipitations are very seldom. Antarctica being a very cold place, it is an extremely dry place. So you have little precipitation every year. When snow falls year after year, you have snowfall. And this snowfall, as it does not melt, like uh, really never melts, what happens to them is that they will compact under the weight of successive snowfalls, this compacting process after a few centuries ends up transforming snow to ice. Therefore, you have a process of transforming snow into ice simply by pressure effect. The moment this snow turns into ice, it will trap in the form of small bubbles the air which circulates between the snowflakes. So you had air which circulated between the flakes and in the process of compacting, this air is trapped in the form of small bubbles. So you will find in the ice, imprisoned in the form of small bubbles, the fossil atmosphere dating from the date of formation of the ice. Afterwards, this ice does not stay in the same place. It turns out that it will, as a general rule, flow towards the ocean. All right. It is a process of accumulation and by gravity or under its, the weight of its own ice. Over long time scales, ice is a little fluid, so it flows and it ends up sometime later, tens of thousands of years, millions of thousands of years later by giving icebergs. So when you're going to choose correctly the location where the coring is done, because that's what we'll be talking about soon, well, it happens that you have a small portion of the ice that is in this process or in this dynamics flows essentially vertically. So it sinks without wandering towards the coast, which means that if you're going to make the hole at the correct location in a vert vertical coring, you will get as depth increases older and older ice, meaning increasingly fossil atmosphere. And all the chemical species 
contained in this atmosphere, which are stable once the bubble has formed, which is the case of CO2. This is also the case, by the way, with methane, because once the methane is no longer in contact with hydroxyl radicals of the atmosphere, it ceases to disappear. So methane that you find in the air bubbles formed in the ice, it represents the methane concentration that you had at the time while the bubble formed, well, on average, over the centuries during which it's formed. So the way we make an ice core is very simple. Here you have a core. So the core, you put it at the surface of uh, the core. You make a big, a big drill hole, uh, so a big hole. And you understood in the lecture on oil that we are the kings of holes. We know very well how to do that. And so there you go, you collect the ice core. So here is what an ice core looks like, and which is much more precious, obviously, than the one that will end up in your whiskey. And here we are taking it out of a tube. We are going to cut it in small pieces and label them carefully to indicate each how deep it was taken. And we send that to the laboratory of, um, I don't remember the name right now, but the one in Grenoble, which studies what is in the ice cores. So in the ice cores, we'll find two things. We'll find both the ice itself and by analyzing the isotopic composition of water, that is to say, the fraction of oxygen 18 or the fraction of deuterium in the hydrogen of water, we are able to reconstruct the planetary temperature of the time. Because when the water evaporates, you have what is called an isotopic fractionation, meaning that the greater the temperature at the place of evaporation, the more the water vapor carries in proportion more oxygen 18 and deuterium. Which is obviously, which obviously then pre precipitates all over the world, including Antarctica, to form the snow of the ice cap. So the isotopic oxygen 18 and deuterium content in the ice of a cap is a marker of a planetary temperature. And you will find air, um, air in the small bubbles, and the air in the small bubbles will be a marker of the content of CO2, methane, nitrous oxide also works, which you had in the atmosphere of ancient times. Yes. So as in Antarctica, you will find water precipitating after being evaporated all over the entire surface of the ocean. Overall, it is a marker of the planetary temperature. So for CO2, it is also a marker of the planetary CO2 because since the lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere, it is of the order of centuries and millennia, I mean, the CO2 surplus, while the interhemispheric mixing time of the atmosphere is of the order of the year. Basically, you emit CO2 absolutely anywhere. So, I mean, I, I was going to talk about this later, but whatever. So, you emit CO2 anywhere and the concentrations will homogenize very quickly. And so, since in addition, at that time, you had few concentrated CO2 sources susceptible to disturb uh, locally, let's say, the measurement, um, because if you had a volcano right next to the ice core, that would be a bit annoying, but here it's not the case. Well, you will have a marker of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere as a whole. So when you analyze the um, greenhouse gases concentration in... Uh, oh, sorry, no. Uh, you can do this in Antarctica. You could do that in Greenland. In the old days, you can no longer do that in modern day Greenland because there are many places in Greenland where now the snow melts at the surface of the ice cap. And so from there on, obviously, you no longer have this accumulation phenomena year after year, which gives you strata which are well dated in time. A part of what falls flows, gets the hell out of here, etc. So it's not all exploitable anymore. So what you have here is the concentration of CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, not at the same scale, but it doesn't matter. So you see that until the beginning of the pre-industrial era, all that is stable, and the industrial era arrives and you see the concentration that begins to rise extremely quickly. Today we can go back with the oldest cores, or, or the deepest cores to be more precise, that was collected in Antarctica to about 800,000 years. So over 800,000 years, we are able to reconstruct the concentration of CO2 and methane that you have here. And I have put for you right here at scale the surplus in concentrations that we have already created over just a century and a half or two centuries.
And what you see is that at geological timescales, where climatic variations have generated or have gone hand in hand with variations in greenhouse gases, in this case it is rather the astronomical forcings which change the temperature on Earth and that changes the equilibrium concentration of greenhouse gases, I'll come back to this in the next court. So here you see that it varies a little bit, but you see that we have already gone totally outside the natural variations with what we have added, and the gray periods here are warm inter interglacial periods, such as the one we had started living in for the last 10,000 years, and you see that it corresponds to higher concentrations of greenhouse gases. So, with regard to CO2, it is the process of removing CO2 from the ocean which is at work, since hot water dissolves CO2 less well than cold water. So when you have an astronomical forcing that heats the temperature of the planet, it warms the oceans, at this time the oceans decast a little more CO2, and by the way it warms the planet even more, at some point the phenomena eventually cushions and balances, but you, you have an amplification phenomena, and this is the reason why the exit out of glaciation is much faster than the entry into glaciation, because you have this amplification phenomena or positive feedback. And as far as methane is concerned, it is hotter implies more humid. I told you earlier, since there is an intensifying water cycle, right? So more wetlands, so more methane emissions, since natural methane is mainly emitted by wetlands. It is a marker of wetlands, since to produce methane naturally, you must have an area where vegetation rots um, away from the air's oxygen, typically swamps, etc. So the more you increase wetlands, and the more you increase methane emissions. And the question obviously is, where are we going with this in the future? So you see that even before talking about the future, the discontinuity that we have introduced into the atmosphere is extremely brutal with regards to what happens in geological timescales. And because of the lifespan of the CO2 excess in the atmosphere, even with emissions that strongly reduce tomorrow morning, we are still very, very far from having seen the totality of the consequences that of what we have already done, all right? We are not in an instantaneous system in which the consequences are immediately after the emissions. We will see this next time. It will spread out over thousands of years after emissions, all right? So there, the question is, you know, where do, where do we stop? We do not have today, and far from it, the highest ever concentration of CO2 in the planetary atmosphere. We had ancient geological eras where the CO2 concentration was much higher than today. So here you have a marker of the amount of CO2 present in the atmosphere since the beginning of the primary era and it is expressed in multiples of the current concentration. So you see that there were times where there was 20 times more CO2, maybe even 30 times more, uh, a long time ago. But these times also corresponded to times when solar power was, was lower. And moreover, at that time, there was probably very little life on emerged lands, meaning that the emerged lands were still essentially deserts and life was essentially in the ocean. So, in the climate change we're talking about today, my opinion is that the probability that climate change will cause the eradication of all life on Earth seems quite weak to me. What will be at stake, obviously, is where the cursor moves on places where things are going well and places where things are going less well, right? This is the question. But that's obviously not going to wipe out all of life on Earth, yes? So the quantity of CO2 I just explained, since we have oceans, the quantity of CO2 is controlled a little by solar radiation, since when the solar radiation retained by the planet, according to the variation of astronomical parameters, is more important, then the oceans are warmed up and it degasses a little CO2. So there you have a, um, a piloting process. When you have vegetation that is doing well, which is what happened after the appearance of vegetation in the Cambrian era, there you had uh, correspondingly CO2 that decreased. There, so you have processes that are linked, so solar radiation, the amount of vegetation and CO2 in the air. But what is important in what I am telling you is the speed at which the process is evolving. It's a matter of speed, this whole, this whole story. So to resume, and we'll talk more about this at the time of the consequences, 
if you go into a wall at 3 kilometers per hour, you have a bump on your head. And if you go at 100 kilometers per hour, you are dead. So here, we're talking about exactly the same thing. There are movements of a system which are not disturbing because they are made over slow periods of time and therefore there are possible adaptations. And there are movements of a system which are more annoying because they are carried out over periods of time which are too short for the system to adapt in good conditions. And unfortunately, we are going for the second option. This is what is troublesome, and that's why we need to spend five hours on it. So we don't just uh, have CO2 in greenhouse gases. So I told you earlier, and I'm coming back to it, once we know that there's not only CO2 in this business, for those of you, that is to say normally everyone if the community does its job well, who will be somewhat interested in climate change issue in their future profession, as it is a transversal thing, everyone needs to care about it a little, you are going to need a metric because there is not just one greenhouse gas. If there was only one greenhouse gas, it would be simple. The metric is the weight of CO2. We only have CO2, we measure it by weight, and it is worse to emit three kilograms than one kilogram. But since we have several greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, etc., is it more bad to emit one kilogram of methane or one kilogram of CO2? If my boss tells me you have a thousand euros to reduce something, and that I have the option of reducing methane by 3% or CO2 by 10%, what do I choose? Well, you cannot answer this question until you have a unit of comparison, a currency, that is to say something that lets you say that's X times more serious or X times less serious than CO2. So this currency is called GWP. The GWP means the global warming potential. It is the cumulative radiative forcing that a unit of additional greenhouse gas in the atmosphere creates. And rather than looking at it in absolute terms, we have chosen that this unit be a relative unit. So it's in fact the ratio between the cumulative radiative forcing of a unit of greenhouse gas over a given period divided by the radiative forcing over the same period of the same weight in CO2. This means that by convention, the GWP of CO2 is equal to one regardless of the time horizon, okay? This unit depends on the time horizon and it depends on the radiative forcing. So I'm coming back to the curve that I showed you earlier, this one. So you ha see that if I take, for example, this gas, which is a hollow carbon, and that I limit my time horizon to one year, well, I will have a ratio, and this is logarithmic, so 10,000 10, times, so the GWP of this stuff is 10,000 times the GWP of CO2. But if I limit my time horizon to a thousand years, well, this stuff will have been cleansed much faster than CO2, and therefore my ratio of integrals, because that's what it is, a ratio of integrals over a given time period, it will have an extremely different value. So there is a debate which may seem a little technical to you, like boring, fussy, which is what's the right timescale. And this is not at all a nitpicking debate because depending on the timescale that you take, in particular for methane, so methane at one century is 25 times more harmful than CO2, but at 20 years it is approximately 80 times more harmful than CO2. So what do I take, 20 years or a century? Well, if I take 20 years, New Zealand, which emits a lot of methane because it has plenty of sheep and cows, starts to shout. Same for countries which grow rice. Whereas if I take a century, it is the countries which have more CO2 in their emission inventory that start to shout, saying, no, no, this puts me in a disadvantage. So you see that this subject, which may seem a little technical and anecdotal, in fact, it pilots the way in which we will distribute the load of the effort depending on the emission sources. Yes? Because growing rice emits methane. I'll come back to it later. Well, a rice field is an artificial swamp. So you have organic debris that decomposes away from the air's oxygen. So you have anaerobic decomposition, which emits methane. All anaerobic decompositions emit methane. Uh, this is the same principle, by the way, that is used nowadays in methanizers, which you may have heard of. We do exactly the same thing. We put plant material protected from the oxygen of the air, which is fed to primitive bacteria, which are called archaea, which emit methane. So, once you have uh, the... Well, this is precisely about methane. I should have just told you. Next slide. <laughs> 
So we will be able to compare greenhouse gas emissions. Here is, for example, methane emissions. At the moment, I count them in tons of methanes, or more exactly, in millions of tons of methane. So where does methane come from? Uh, well, you have it here. So first, you have so rice paddies, which is where rice is grown, here. Wait, no, actually, that's uh, coal mining. Um, so here is the distribution of gas. These are the leaks in the gas network because natural gas is methane. These are the coal mines. So refer to what I told you last time. When a coal vein forms, there is methane that is absorbed on the coal, you remember? And so when mining the coal, methane is emitted into the atmosphere because we ventilate the mines to avoid the miners from going boom. Then on top you have biomass combustion. So why does biomass combustion emit methane? Because methane is a volatile element that forms when wood um, catches fire. And part of this methane is not burned uh, at the moment of the combustion. And so it escapes into the atmosphere. Above you have livestock. It is the cattle herd and um, well, basically the ruminants. All right. And in there, you basically have cows. So we have a billion and a half or to two billion cows on Earth. So cows represent the first biomass of animals. No, sorry, uh, the first biomass of mammals, not animals. It is the first bio biomass of mammals on Earth, right in front of humans. And the cows burp methane. They fart it very little, I specify. So why is it that they burp methane? Because the cows are superior to you and to me and they have four stomachs instead of one. And in these stomachs, you have a complex process of anaerobic fermentation. So meaning in the absence of oxygen from the air. And in this anaerobic fermentation process, you have methane that forms and the methane exits through the upper airways. And uh, which contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. So here you have, in fact, rice paddies. That's the process I talked about earlier. It is decomposition away from the oxygen in the air. And here you have landfills, which translates in French to décharge. Yes. So why do we have methane emissions from landfills? Same motive, same punishment. Because in landfills, you have in particular organic wastes, your potato peelings. Well, for those of you who peel potatoes. And so when it arrives in a, in a landfill, well, um, the wastes pile up on top of each other and some of these wastes will ferment away from the oxygen of the air and therefore emit methane. So today in most landfills in Western countries, this methane is captured, but it is not the case everywhere in the world. Another greenhouse gas I told you about is nitrous oxide. So nitrous oxide, even if this pie chart is a bit old, it is still valid in, um, in its causes and in, and in its orders of magnitude. You have um, uh, here nitrogen, nitrous oxide that arises from the combustion processes. So you know combustion is a process in which you oxidize something with oxygen from the air. But in general, the oxygen from the air, you don't bring it pure to where it burns, you bring it with the nitrogen from the air. And so the combustion process will rearrange nitrogen and oxygen as a nitrogen oxide. So the nitrogen oxides from automobile pollution, which you may hear about, well, it's simply the, the nitrogen that has entered the engine, which ended up in the engine's combustion chamber, which recombined with oxygen and which emerged in the form of nitrogen oxide. And some of these nitrogen oxides is nitrous oxide, a small part. And it's the same thing in the industry and it's the same thing in, um, in boilers of buildings. So you have an essential cause, which is, um, which is agriculture. So why do you have nitrous oxide emissions in agriculture? Because agriculture uses fertilizers and fertilizers contain nitrogen molecules. This is one of the contributions of fertilizers, the nitrogen molecules. Then these nitrogen molecules, when you spread them on the ground, and that works with synthetic fertilizers, but also with pig manure or cow manure. Well, there is a small part of the molecules that will form nitrous oxide under the effect of the microbial action of soils. So these are soil emissions linked to the application of nitrogenous fertilizers. So then you have molecules called halocarbons. So like I've told you earlier, these are molecules that we made by replacing in the hydrocarbons, the hydrogen by halogens. So why did we bother doing this? Quite simply because the carbon-halogen bond 
is a bond which is extremely stable, which means that when you make this kind of compound, especially when they are saturated, you make molecules that are almost indestructible and therefore non-toxic. These are molecules that have replaced other uses because of their interesting physical properties, where before we used gases which were potentially toxic or aggressive. So in cold chains, it has replaced CO2 that we used at one time, which was a little less good in terms of thermodynamics. And above all, ammonia. I don't know if some of you have already had fun inhaling a big puff of ammonia, but it's not that great. So we prefer to put in refrigerant circuits molecules of halogenated gases, because if you take a big breath, basically nothing happens to you. It's totally inert. The same goes for propellants of aerosol cans. These gases were used instead of the hydrocarbons that we used before, with which kids uh, in the time where I was a child were laughing, ha ha ha, he he he, while making a big flamethrower out of a thing. It was a, basically a big blowtorch like that. And since a few kids exploded their face with it, we replaced it with something that didn't burn. It also served as a foam expander gas. So if you have an old fridge from the 50s lying around in your cellar, the insulating foam of the fridge was made with a gas like this, which served as an expander gas. So your foam is filled with halocarbons. And if you disturb the foam and expose it to the air, it goes into the atmosphere and it increases the greenhouse effect. And finally, it also serves as a solvent in the semiconductor industry. So the... The most dangerous of these halocarbons for the ozone layer, which was called the CFC, has since been eradicated. CFC was a very stable molecule like all the others, chlorofluorocarbides, so only chlorine, fluorine, and carbon. But since it was very stable, it had time to go up to the upper atmosphere without being chemically attacked by anything. In the upper atmosphere, it is dissociated by the hard ultraviolet rays, and then the chlorine released by this reaction attacks the stratospheric ozone. So we stopped production. We didn't stop emissions because you have CFCs which were used precisely as foam expanding gas and therefore they are still in old fridges that are continued to be dismantled today. And so we haven't completely stopped it. And then you have a certain number of countries which have secretly continued to make some. So we replaced them with gases which have roughly the same thermodynamic properties in the cold chain, but which are not harmful for the ozone layer. On the other hand, they are extremely powerful greenhouse gases. There, so you still have gases of this nature, but emissions today are still much smaller than they were in the 50s. Then you have another greenhouse gas, which I talked about, that it has no direct emission, which is ozone. So ozone, I say it again, is found in two places. You have it in the upper atmosphere, and this one interests us enormously. It interests us for two reasons. It interests us the hard ultraviolet rays from the sun. So that's a first thing that interests us, because otherwise the hard ultraviolet rays would interfere with life as we know it on Earth, and has a second effect, which is much less known, which is that as it absorbs energy in the upper atmosphere, it therefore warms the upper atmosphere and creates what is called a temperature inversion, which means that the temperature which, by a basic thermodynamic effect, decreases when the pressure decreases, so when you go up, up to the tropopause, that is to say, up to the limits of the stratosphere, and then begins to heat up when we enter the stratosphere. So this temperature inversion has something absolutely fundamental, which is that it limits the convection of water vapor at the limit of the tropopause. If this, this temperature inversion did not occur, the water vapor would not stop at 15 kilometers above ground, it would, it would keep going higher, which would be a bit unhandy for precipitations. And in addition, the water vapor would also be exposed to the hard ultraviolet rays of the sun, which would have long since dissociated water in oxygen, which would have remained on Earth, and hydrogen, which would have gone into space, because the molecule is too volatile. So the water that arrived on Earth, if the ozone layer had not created this temperature inversion, it would have disappeared. And so that's also something absolutely crucial for sustaining life on Earth. So this stratospheric ozone is formed by the interaction of atmospheric oxygen with ultraviolet rays, 
it has its own cycle and it does not move from the stratosphere. And again, we like it a lot because of the two effects I just mentioned. Closer to the ground, you have tropospheric ozone, ozone which appears close to the ground. This one interests us much less because it does not appear for the same reasons at all. This one appears because we play a little chemist, basically. We put in the atmosphere a whole cocktail, so it's basically top chef, top chef of pollution. And we put in the atmosphere nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds. We stir it all with a little solar radiation. You need a bit of solar radiation. And there you are, ozone appears. But this one, we don't like it at all because it enters our lungs and participates in the greenhouse effect. Okay, so this one, if we could avoid it, we would prefer that. Here you have maps that show you that the concentration of just about anything in holocarbons has sharply increased in the last decades. And there you have maps which compare the background ozone concentration. And you see that it has increased extremely strongly, meaning that although ozone is a very aggressive oxidizer, meaning that its lifespan in the atmosphere is short, because as soon as it is formed, it finds something to eat and throws itself on it, as we continue to produce it continuously, you have a background ozone concentration that is permanently above our heads, more or less elevated, but permanently. Also note, ozone is a growth inhibitor for plants. So in locations where the ozone concentration is a little high, and since it takes time for ozone to form, in the Paris region, for example, it is not where the road traffic is that you have the maximum ozone concentration. In general, it needs time to form, so the maximum the ozone concentration is a little is always a little downwind of the city, so 10, 20, 30 kilometers, it's never right in Paris. It is therefore an inhibitor of the growth of plants. So once you have a comparison of gases one with another, we can rep yes, because it is a plant growth inhibitor. <laughs> I mean, it's simply an observed effect. You know, the why is always a how of the time before. So in fact, it inhibits, I don't know exactly what reaction in photosynthesis and there it's just a growth inhibitor. Once you have an element of comparison of the gases between one another, we will be able to start to represent greenhouse gases or rather their emissions in the form of pie charts. So pie charts, there are plenty. You can represent by gas, you can represent by uh, source, you can represent by country, all gases, all gases combined, etc. So I will offer you a number of pie charts and I will paradoxically not start with the pie chart in which the, there are the gases compared to one another since uh, you'll see that later. Rather, I will start with a pie chart in which I have attributed the greenhouse gas emissions, all gases combined, therefore CO2, methane, etc., to a number of business sectors. All right? So the totality of sectors is 100% of what we do, and I break that down in a way that I hope to be meaningful. Methane emitted from coal mines being included, so it's really a global view, the coal-fired power plants currently represent 20% of the world's emissions. So said otherwise, one CO2 ton equivalent out of five is, um, well, um, so, so since all gases are compared to CO2 in the global warming potential, you agree with me that all other gases are counted as CO2 equivalents, yes? The global warming potential is taken at 100 years. It means that one CO2 ton equivalent out of five emitted in the world comes from a coal-fired power plant or its supply chain. One in five. Then you have uh, gas and oil power plants, so it's mainly gas, which represents around 7% of global emissions, in which is included emissions from the methane produced in the uphill gas supply chain. Adding also fuels used by cement factories, the production of cement is 6% of planetary emissions. Remember that uh, French emissions are 1.5% if you want to have a baseline for everything I am telling you. That should uh, give you a little idea. The rest of the industry is 12%, so in there is counted direct emissions, 
I didn't count the emissions from electricity production used by the industry. If we add the electricity production used by the industry, the share of the industry goes from, um, well, um, sorry, if you include cement factories from 18% to something between 25 and 30%. Because a good share of the electricity obviously goes through the industrial processes. So there you have 12 in which the steelworks represent about 4%. Knowing that about half of the steel produced in the world is used to make buildings and infrastructures like bridges, um, and etc., and that all of the cement is used to do this, that basically means that constructing buildings and bridges on Earth is a small 10% of planetary emissions. All right? So, here, you also find an element of demographic growth. If there is more people, more buildings are constructed. Heating of buildings represents 6% of emissions. So I hear you saying, what? Only 6%? Well, earlier in the graph of France, we saw that, etc. Yes, only 6% of emissions. Why? Because a good part of the buildings in the world do not need to be heated. If you have a building in Southern California, its problem is not really to be heated. If you have a building in Singapore, its problem is not really to be heated. If you have a building in Lagos, its problem is not really to be heated. Its problem, however, is possibly to be air conditioned. And in this case, the emissions from the air conditioning are not there because it's not a heater. And that you will find them there and there since they are emissions from electric production. But on direct heating, a good part of buildings in the world do not need it. There you, um, I mean, in France, you do not have this very important share because we have very few coal-fired power plants. And the share here is smaller because we have finished building our infrastructure and we are building at a less frenetic pace than the high demographic growth countries. So the share of cement factories is lower and so on. And by an effect of smaller pie chart slices in the number of places, the other slices are correspondingly larger. But it's just to show that the shares can vary a lot depending on the country. Then this very big pink slice is transport. So in transport, the global car fleet is around 6%. The global truck fleet is around 4%. The, um, so when I say 6%, it may be 7%, but it is of that order of magnitude. The global boat fleet is about 2%, and the global aircraft fleet is also about 2%, not counting non-CO2 gases, but I don't have the time to talk about this during this lesson, so remember 2%. So what you see at this stage is that, for example, in the uses of machine type, well, the global fleet of cement plants is the same problem as the global fleet of cars. So we're not talking about something that is completely anecdotal. The global fleet of steelworks is the same as the global fleet of trucks. You can also see that coal plants are more important than all the means of transport in the world if we look at emissions. There, so you start to have a baseline that tells you if I want to take care of the problem, where to start. And you see that it's not just we're going to eliminate cars and stop there because the problem is more complicated than that. 20% of our emissions come from eating. So they are essentially non-CO2 gases. You find in there the cows, um, the rest of the ruminant herd, but which are less important, rice fields and um, nitrous oxides uh, from the fields, and also CO2 from the tractors, but which is a totally minor contribution. Then you have deforestation. Deforestation, as I said earlier, is an upstream process of the agricultural activity, which means that eating, in the broad sense, is rather 30% of planetary emissions. And finally, we find here miscellaneous sources, including, for example, waste management or, for example, cold chain leaks, etc. A whole bunch of various sources. So here, this is one way of presenting greenhouse gas emissions. I presented them to you here by large sets of, um, of direct emissions. So in France, this is what it looks like. You see that we find the same slices in the pie chart, but not represented in the same way. So you find that transport comes first, then buildings and agriculture, or, or actually buildings, ag agriculture, and industry roughly all equal. And finally, the energy sector, which is small because once again, cold-fired electric generation, we have very little. 
And that's what makes most of a difference. There is another way to present greenhouse gas emissions, which are the emissions that result from our carbon footprint. So what is our carbon footprint? It is, as opposed to emissions which are said to be territorial, that is to say emissions that are made in France, they are emissions that correspond to what we consume. When you look at emissions presented as this, these are the emissions that take place on French soil. But the clothes you wear, for example, there were many of them that have been made in elsewhere. So, for example, if you wear, like I mentioned in the first course, synthetic fibers, for these synthetic fibers, a part of their emissions comes from elsewhere. So oil had to be extracted, the petroleum molecules had to be cracked, plastic had to be made, then transformed, and the monomers polymerized, etc. A whole bunch of things, some part of it was not made in France. So, yeah, for the poly-something fibers, the emissions were not made in France. If you buy a computer today, that computer was not produced in France. So the, com the production emissions from this computer are essentially extraterritorial emissions. If you buy Spanish tomatoes in the season, which is very bad because it pumps the water tables, but whatever, then you bought tomatoes that generated emissions. For example, to operate pumps, or for example, to enrich CO2 greenhouses, because it turns out that there are greenhouses that are enriched with CO2 so that the tomatoes grow faster, so we burn gas to enrich the greenhouses in CO2. All this did not necessarily take place in France, and so on and so forth. And then if you buy a car that a manufacturer, even a French one, has manufactured in Romania or Morocco, the corresponding emissions also didn't take place in France. So, in the vision of territorial emissions, you only look at what is made in France, but it doesn't necessarily correspond to what you will buy or consume. It doesn't necessarily correspond to that. It corresponds to what happens in our country. And correlatively, some of the emissions that happen in our country are at the service of something that will be consumed abroad. So, for example, when you build an Airbus in France, the production emissions of the Airbus, are normally, in a consumption point of view, they are to be charged to the airline that will buy the Airbus from you, who is not necessarily a French company and actually essentially not a French company. And when you make wine, which is not very, very intensive in CO2, but anyways, I mean, you have to make the bottle, carry it around in a truck, you have to run the tractors, etc. Well, this bottle of wine, if it is exported, these emissions take place in France, but you're not the one who will enjoy drinking the bottle. So territorial emissions are the emissions that are happening in France. In a consumption perspective, we use something called the carbon footprint that you see here and which um, corresponds to emissions that took place so that you could benefit from the product or service you are using. All right. The domestic emissions of a Frenchman, if you take again the curve I showed you earlier, the one, um, sorry. So if I take this curve again and I divide by the population, we get the number of a little under six tons of CO2 per Frenchman per year, just for CO2. If we add the non-CO2 gases, it's rather 8. So, these 6 tons correspond to domestic emissions. There, on the vision that I give of the carbon footprint per Frenchman, we see that the total is rather 10 point something. 11. So, we see that we are above the 8 tons mentioned earlier. The difference is what? The emissions that took place outside the country and which correspond to the consumer goods that we have imported in order to consume them in our country. So regarding the climatic virtue of France, there's obviously a question that arises. It's can it be appreciated in terms of territorial emissions? So we say in our country, we do not emit much. Or is it appreciated with regards to the emissions of our consumption? And at this point, we should be able to say what we consume in our country, it doesn't emit much. And it's a little different. Yes? 
So China's domestic emissions have become on CO2 somewhat higher than that of France. On the other hand, as you know it, if you read the recent run-ins between the Chinese and Mr. Trump, part of the Chinese emissions are used for exportation. So in terms of consumption vision, the Chinese are below us. In territorial vision, they are now slightly above the French. Still below the Europeans, but not much. In, in this consumption vision, you take the domestic emissions and you remove what is exported and you add what is imported, basically. So we go from 6 or 8 to 10, and what you see on the decomposition of this graph in the end is um, where or to which acts of everyday life are the emissions that we have today associated with. And in the end, it asks the question of the citizen consumer voter, where is he going to have to make efforts, alone or in association with the people who provided him with products and services, to reduce emissions? All right, that's the question. So, for emissions in France, a first part comes from the fact that we are building housing. So you know that each year we build housing, we build a few hundred thousand. So obviously not every person builds himself a house every year. Maybe it would work for a few petroleum emirs, but not for the ordinary Frenchman, it doesn't work that way. On the other hand, each year in France you have a few hundred thousand housing that is built. And if I say relative to one Frenchman, I look at what it represents in emissions, Basically, it represents a few hundred kilos of CO2 per Frenchman per year. That is to say, roughly the construction of 1 to 1.5 square meters per French person per year. All right? Housing construction emissions are a few hundred kilos of CO2 per square meter. All right? Depending on what you do in individual housing and collective housing, etc., let's say that it fluctuates between 200 and 400. So you see that when you build a house or an apartment of 100 square meters, well, that's in one go, 20 to 40 tons of CO2 by suddenly going to the atmosphere. So where do, we, do these 20 to 40 tons of CO2 come from? From the steel that must be made to make the reinforcing bars, from the cement that must be made to make concrete, from plastic that will be used throughout the building, the frames of windows, the tarpaulins that you put on the floor, waterproofing of a house or of your apartment. I mean, plastic is all over the place in buildings. And from tiles and from bricks, and I mean, etc. So per Frenchman in one year, 1.5 square meter in order of magnitude. And yeah. Then you have a second element, which is thermal comfort and energetic comfort of housing. Confer what I told you in the first class, even though we say that France is an all nuclear country, we use four times more energy in fossil form for heating buildings than electric energy four times more. So, much of the CO2, I mean, of the greenhouse gas emissions, and in this case it's mainly CO2, that we find in housing comes from heating, which is mainly made using gas and fuel oil. So, this here is the part excluding heating, which is here indeed purely electric. So, in France, we have a very low electricity emission factor, even taking into account imports, because sometimes we do import some electricity. If we were in Poland, this little piece here, what size would it be? Compared to that one, I mean, would it double, would it quadruple, would it sextuple, would it tenuple? So basically, it would octuple, and I'm not even sure if that would exist, but it would be multiplied by 8 to 10. So that bar here would be superior to that bar there. So this is one of the characteristics of France, which, as you know, has low carbon electricity. If you go to Switzerland, to Sweden, to Norway, you will find a proportion, or, or more exactly an importance, of the home electricity consumption in the total carbon footprint, which is also going to be reasonably low. On the other hand, if you go to countries which have electricity which is high carbon, and therefore in countries in which, in addition to heating, there is air conditioning, typically in a continental climate in the middle of the United States, we freeze to death in winter and we die from heat in summer, and there you will, and in, in addition their houses are poorly insulated, there you will have both significant heating emissions and very high electricity consumption, consumption emissions, potentially. Then we find this bar here, which is called Yum Yum.
So what you can see is that on this graph, and there are analyses that give this slightly below consumer goods, but these are the two main emission sources that stand out. Roughly, what will come first in the carbon footprint of a French person is the greenhouse gas emissions that are the counterpart of what you buy in both current and durable goods. And these also include purchases like washing machines, cars, etc. and the food. So food and shopping are roughly half the carbon footprint of a French person. So every time you go to the sales, bam, the CO2 meter goes up. I mean, every time you go to buy clothes or a sofa, or, or as soon as you walk into a supermarket and come out with something that is not eatable, like a toothbrush or toilet brush or whatever you want, the CO2 has gone up because we had to make one of these uh, 100,000 products since that's about the number of things that you find in the supermarket nowadays. And so, as I explained to you in the first lesson, the chain has started from the extraction of the raw materials to the last delivery to the supermarket for that product or service to exist. So, in, um, in food and in purchases, I've put the biggest con contributing component in each column. And so, the threat was... Uh, not allocated to the product because at the time we did this analysis in Carbon 4, we were not able to allocate freight by category of merchandise. So you could say that we could have done an estimate, which is um, a distribution at pro rata of values, except that in reality, freight is at pro rata of tonnages and tonnages is not necessarily value, right? So a truck that carries computers is not the same value as a truck that carries salads. I mean, regarding the contents of the cargo. So we struggled and we didn't impute. On the other hand, what you see here is that the biggest contributor of food is meat, and in particular red meat. And if I add the dairy products that are another derivative of the cattle herd, then the share of emissions that come in France from the existence of a cattle herd is between half and two thirds of our carbon footprint. Yes? Of course. In fact, it's a life cycle analysis. So what we're going to count in the emissions of the meat are agricultural emissions that are used to grow the plants that will feed the animal. So you have the tractor's gasoline, you have the manufacture of nitrogen fertilizers that will be used on the plant crops. And this is made by cracking methane. So, I mean, nitrogen fertilizers, that's chemistry of ammonia. And chemistry of ammonia, that starts by producing hydrogen by cracking methane. And that makes as much CO2 as you want. Yeah, I'm just going to finish to answer this question and then I'll get to you. So uh, you also you have the N2O emissions from the fields. You'll also have that since it was necessary that these emissions take place to have the plants. And then you have the emissions from the cow's metabolism. All right. I mean, yeah. And all that put end to end. And in fact, all that put together, that makes the carbon footprint of meat in the column that you see right there. It's the same with cheeses, uh, except that there's a matter of allocation. That is to say, the cattle herd produces meat, milk, and cheese, that is to say, processed milk. And the question is, how do we allocate that? So we can discuss it for hours. How do we, do we allocate it economically or based on mass, knowing that a dairy cow makes 10 tons of milk per year for a few years, and then in the end you have 500 kilos of carcass remain. So is meat a waste, in which case it's worth zero, or is meat the thing that is expensive and so it's not worth zero at all? And so there, there's a bunch of possibilities. And so that's the idea in the diagram that I'm showing you. We count everything that was necessary from start to finish. So yeah, there's a question here in the back. Be careful, do not confuse two things. Here what I'm counting is not the CO2 of the carbon contained in the plant, it's the greenhouse gas emissions without the carbon contained in the plant that are necessary for the plants to grow. So for plants to grow, you have a tractor that rolls by and that burns diesel or gas. That's not the carbon in the plants. You spread fertilizer in the field, that's N2O, that's not the carbon in the plants. And I'm not going to count it a second time because the cow, when it ruminates, it is not equivalent to passing a tractor through a field. And that's also not equivalent to spreading fertilizers on the ground. And so it's the whole chain. And there was a question in the back. <laughs> yes, that's what I said earlier. It's a matter of allocation. So 
basically to make a kilo of Conte cheese, which is excellent, of course, I recommend it. You need 10 liters of milk. Therefore, the Conte's carbon content per kilo is roughly 10 times the carbon content of per kilo of milk. And what I showed you was related to a unit of mass. I could have taken another unit. I could have related it to a calorie. I could have related it to a euro. Anyways, there's always a convention to this story. And there I offered you per kilo. Calorie is probably more relevant if you want to start to make comparisons between foods. So, uh, just to finish one last time, the fact that you have so much for milk and so much for meat, I repeat, at some point, it's a convention. If we look at the dairy breeds, we mainly use dairy breeds to produce milk. So you can say that roughly the carcass of a cow at the end of a life is a waste. Meaning you would make milk even if no one bought the carcass. So in a life cycle analysis, when you have a waste that you value, that counts for zero. And if you say that it still has a little value, you can count that to the pro rata of the mass. But once again, since you have 30 tons of milk that have been produced by the cow over its lifespan versus 500 kilos of carcass, in the end, you see that it does not allocate many emissions to meat. If you aggregate together the dairy cows at the end of their life and the beef breeds, which are used for meat, then you have an average value of carbon content per kilo of meat, which is much higher. So it really depends on how the math is done. However, here, what is interesting is that we did not discriminate. That is to say, we took the emissions of the whole cattle herd. And we say that is counted for in meat. Yes? So, nuclear, we have a chapter on it, so I'll talk to you about it then. Here, what I'm just trying to tell, get you thinking about is emissions and me. In other words, in there, what can the consumer decide? I mean, without discussing it at length today, but it prepares this discussion. What can the consumer decide? That is to say, what is within my free will and what can I decide to do or not to do? And what is a little more complicated because it relates to the way society is organized in a context in which we will moderately ask for my opinion. So what you see in the end is that food comes in first position. And it is important to stress this because for a very, very long time and still today, the question of the fight against climate change is often presented as a problem, first of all, non-climate, meaning wind turbines and solar panels, <laughs> and when we do get into climate, of transport. We will focus a lot on transport, while I show you here that the first two sectors as seen from the end consumer are not those. And so in this column you have what you buy, consumer goods. Pop quiz, how high was this column in 1990? Well, in 1990, the column was the height of that plus that. Meaning, in other words, what happened between 1990 and 2010 is that the emissions, which are the counterpart of what we bought before electronics, meaning shirts, tables, sofas, glasses, etc., has remained more or less the same. And we have added to that emissions of electronic manufacturing. And the electronic manufacturing emissions, and so I didn't prepare a slide on it, but I'll try to leave it in the slideshow that I leave as a testament. Um, so remember that today, the emissions of, um, of the global digital system, that is to say the annual production of computers of all kinds, may be servers or computers like the one I'm using, your smartphones, which are in fact computers already much more powerful than the first computer I mentioned earlier that was made in the 1950s, the ENIAC, um, and the network elements which are needed for it to communicate, and the data centers, and the electricity which is necessary every year to supply all this, therefore both the annual production of all these components and the electricity that powers it all every year, well, all of the emissions corresponding to it all, every year is already 4% of the planetary emissions, which is to say the same as the global truck fleet, and it increases by 10% every year, give or take. So if you're looking for something non-sustainable, the, the digital today is the most emblematic thing that we do, which is non-sustainable. The idea that we have dematerialized by putting digital everywhere, unfortunately, it is the exact opposite that we are doing. 
there. So this compartment did not exist 20 years ago, and believe it or not, I was born in a world in which there were no smartphones. Such a world has existed. It has existed. There were no laptops. So there. And even cell phones didn't exist. Here you have the part corresponding to individual trips. So in their professional trips are not taken into account. For example, if you have a speaker coming from the United States to lecture you in this school by plane, because it's unlikely that he'll come by sea kayak, well, then this is not in the carbon footprint of the American at hand because it's a business trip. So here you have only personal travel. What you can see is that the essential is by car, but there is a big package, which is essentially the plane. And the plane is the same. In 1990, this block hardly existed. When I was your age, and sorry to be the old geezer, but I went to the United States for an internship, so it was in uh, 1986. Well, in 1986, to go to plane to the United States was to spend the night in Orly Airport, to take a charter, which you didn't even know at what time it was really going to leave, and then well, it was like the adventure of a lifetime. So you arrived 10 hours in advance, etc., and you did it once, and it felt like a remarkable achievement. And at the time, even more, more than today, it was reserved for the upper part of the upper class, etc. So the plane has exploded over the past 15 years, and by the way, these emissions are not counted in any national inventory because when an Air France plane leaves a German airport to go to the United States with an engine passenger, well, nobody wants the emissions. The French say, no, it carried a passenger who was not from my place to go from Germany to the United States, so it can't be mine. Even if it's Air France, it can't be mine. Germany will say, well, it can't be mine since it was going to the United States. The United States will say it can't be mine since it was carrying an Indian, and the Indian says it can't be mine because I was taking a French plane. So the end result is that these things don't belong to anyone, and it is not in any national inventory, and it is found in a category called international aviation. When you see in the graphs of emissions a line called international aviation, well, these are actually the emissions that nobody wants because it took place in the international space. And so if it is international aviation, that it is a French plane carrying an Indian from Germany to Great Britain, and if it is international shipping, it's the same thing. It is a cargo ship or a container ship from Maersk, a Danish company, which left Antwerp for Shanghai transporting goods made in Korea. And it's the same. Everyone says the emissions aren't mine. Yes? Because it's cheap. This is what I explained last time. So divided to minutes of working time, the price of a plane was divided by 10 plane tickets. So why bother when EasyJet offers you a flight to Bratislava for 40 euros? You just do it. Yes? The train is imperceptible, insignificant. So the train in France is, um, is roughly 2% in orders of magnitude, of course, of the energy for transport, so used by air and road transport. So, and in addition, it's low carbon. So it's not, not visible. I mean, it's in the thickness of the line. It, actually, it's less than the thickness of the line. So um, the, the figures in France for domestic air transport, because we have to compare things that are comparable. So domestic air transport, it's, um, it's a few million passengers per year. So Paris-Toulouse is, let's say, 2.5. So let's say 5 million passengers over a thousand kilometers in orders of magnitude. So that's 5 million times a thousand, which is a 5 billion passenger kilometers. And the train is much more important. It's of the order of 70. Um, so what you see, uh, so, so this bar in 1990, it was only going up to this height, and then this green part was added. And finally, we have public services. And so why do you have emissions for public services? So very bad news for you. Every time you step into this empty theater, you emit greenhouse gases because we have to heat this building in winter and because the school had to be built a long time ago. So now I did various prescription, but because I have, as well as all the other teachers, need to come to school, etc. And so the national education education causes emissions, and the national education employs almost a million people, no, not almost, it actually does employ a million people. It, uh, it heats up a lot of buildings, so there are a lot of educational buildings, high schools, primary schools, etc., which are heated, 
And so these are emissions. And the second major emitter is health. Health probably causes of the order of 5% of a country's carbon footprint because it is necessary to keep the hospitals, manufacture drugs, scanners, consumables, devices that are used to know whether you caught a shameful disease or not, etc. And so all of these things are going to contribute to the hospital's carbon footprint. And finally, the last big emitter in the public service, which you probably didn't think of, is... Ah, that's good, the army. Yes, so for those of you who have seen Top Gun, you remember that the army has large objects that consume lots and lots of kerosene or fuel, and the US army oil consumption is between a third and half of the oil consumption of France. All right. So in France, I mean, we have a smaller army, and it still represents a few points. And I mean, it, and this belongs to us all. So in your carbon footprint, since you are all, so to say, benefiting from the fact that we have a care system, an educational system, and an army. There, so that was the climate change part on uh, what climate is and uh, what are the emissions, etc. And next time we'll see what it does to the climate system and what are the consequences. So there, have a good evening, everyone.